All right, everybody, how's it going? So we're going to go over a few things before we get to our standard day of repairs. The first thing is that I realized that my problem here is actually threefold. A, Spectrum Business seems to allow me to upload SSH FTP to my apartment at the full 20 megabit per second. However, when I upload to YouTube, funny how that 20 megabit per second starts lagging until I put the stream below 3 megabit per second. Not only is my Time Warner cable complete garbage, so in spite of the fact that my traffic seems to have been throttled to some extent because it would, I could upload to home at 20 megabit per second, I couldn't upload to Google more than 3 megabit per second. Imagine that! I also had the issue of constant outages where I can't upload to anything at all. So that was the second issue that I was having that was really confusing. So you had the first issue of Time Warner giving me a faster path to my home via SSH FTP than they were giving me to YouTube or Reach or any of these video services directly. So I set up the VPN. This thing was pretty good. It was 80 bucks for two years. Like, again, I'm not sponsored. I, I don't get paid by these people. I'm, I don't, but it's, it, it works. And I hope to have, help, have somebody help me set up that up with PFSense. The second thing that I need to solve here is the, the, the internet's uh, going down constantly. So I have the Verizon and Time Warner. Time Warner sucks a lot, but P my PFSense router, which switches over to Verizon DSL when the Time Warner goes out, can no longer switch over to Verizon DSL. There was a fire in the building, and as a result, all the wiring was destroyed. They were still billing me in spite of the fact that the wiring was destroyed. They were asking me to reset my modem <laughs> constantly on the phone even when they knew that the wiring and infrastructure to get DSL in here is gone. The copper wire, all that stuff is burned to shit. And the guy on the phone was still saying, reset your modem. Try reset your modem. Try log into your modem. Unplug the plug. Ah! I wanted to bang my head against the wall so hard. But the, ultra, the best part of that is I was still being billed for that entire time. And it took several calls to Verizon to get them to stop billing me for DSL that doesn't work because of burned wiring. So I don't have a secondary internet connection anymore. So I want to get something like this. Now, the third issue that I was having that I wasn't anticipating was with my PC build. Imagine, imagine that. Louis, Louis messed up in building his PC. So the third issue is that my PC, I have this shitty Enermax LickTech TR4 ver second version of the CPU cooler. Not the first version. I got the second version, the one that's supposed to be fixed. It ain't fixed. Every now and then it makes funny noises, and my CPU will just start idling at 65 Celsius. It's, it's very, very aggravating. And I think that was causing some of the pixelated video you were seeing yesterday. So, you, and you also may hear that every now and then my fans go to 3,000 RPM to make up for the fact that the Enermax's pump is not working. So it thinks, oh crap, make the fans go faster, but that's not going to work if the pump is not, not working. So this is what I wound up ordering from this performance PC website. Uh, the, the last part of my PC that was pathetic was that piece of shit Enermax all-in-one liquid cooler. So I got this thing. Hey, you could probably hear it shooting up again. So I think that by the end of the week, when I have an LTE backup, I have my VPN set up at PFSense properly, and this machine is not uh, burning anymore, that I will finally be able to do live streams regularly without fuck-ups. Now, uh, I, I, am a, I am a greedy, greedy capitalist, so if you would like to help me with the uh, stream upgrades here, I am uh, selling some things. I'm going around the store and finding stuff that I no longer need and uh, getting rid of it. So this has been sitting on my monitor for quite a while. I got some G-Skill... Um, uh, 14, 14, 14, 34 RAM, so I don't really need this stuff anymore. So if you would like, today, if you, li if you like, Lewis's yard sale is starting. So over here, you'll notice that we have some very unique fuck Apple RAM. So w this is $400 for 64 gigabytes of DDR4 fuck Apple RAM. Uh, this RAM, it, do not confuse fuck Apple RAM with Apple RAM. The difference between Apple RAM, so the difference that you have between Apple RAM and fuck Apple RAM is that Apple RAM will work in an Apple MacBook. However, fuck Apple RAM will not work in an Apple MacBook. So this is fuck Apple RAM. I have written fuck Apple on each of the DIMMs. Some of them say fuck AAPL, as in the stock. Some say fuck APPLE, as in I actually thought I could spell it out, but didn't realize there was only eight chips instead of nine. So this here is genuine, genuine OEM fuck Apple RAM straight from Rossman Repair. And if you purchase this, it will make my wallet cry a tiny bit less at spending money on a VPN, spending money on somebody who's going to help fix my PFSense router at the store, and um, buying this, th this thing so, and paying for internet so that I, my streams will not stop going down from the $480 a month internet I'm already paying for. And it will also help fund the, uh, the water cooling shit I got so that my computer will stop getting the sh will, will stop do being annoying. I got this thing with overnight shipping, so hopefully I get it tomorrow, and Mikey may do a stream of that. One thing you may notice in store.rossmangroup.com is there is only one in stock. This is a limited edition. You will never see this again. 
This is a limited edition fuck Apple RAM. Hundreds of millions of people have Apple RAM, but you today can be the first and only person in the world to have fuck Apple RAM. Think about it. You may not know what the timings of this memory are. You may not know what the bandwidth of this memory is. You may not even know who makes the RAM chips because I can't see if it says Alpida or Samsung or Micron on it. I can't tell who makes the chips. But what I can tell you is that it's fuck Apple RAM. All right, today we're gonna be working on another MacBook. This is an A1398 MacBook. It has liquid damage. It won't turn on. It needs to be fixed. Let's open this MacBook up and see what it looks like on the inside. The inside of this MacBook. Chris says, I bet it was Paul Daniels that called you, says Arvid. Chris said, Caroline, who would want to talk to that face? Caroline's not calling me. She's not calling me from a 646 number. Caroline's not calling me from a 646 number. You troll. Also, Caroline is a female, which means she probably doesn't exist. Remember, a girl is an acronym. On a motherboard repair channel, girl is acronym for guy in real life. Do not trust anybody that claims to be a girl on a motherboard repair channel. I used to think that Jessa was a woman, and then I started teaching class with her, and I realized that she would say suck my dick ten times more than every man that I knew combined. So even Jessa, even Jessa, guy in real life, just got to inspect further. Guy in real life. Guy in real life. Why call the shop after hours? It's, it's, it's fine. Leave a voicemail. It's cool. Hang up and call back when the voicemail says we close at 8. That just makes you a cunt. Okay. So, what we have done here is we are going to unplug the battery and see how much amperage is taken when I first plug it in. Do realize that the amount of power that a board is taking is going to tell me a lot. 200 milliamps, short on PP bus. 100 milliamps, all says power good circuit not working. 20 milliamps, PM sleep S4L missing slash on Paul's desk. Uh, different amounts of power being drawn are going to tell me different things about the machine. So I want to know exactly how much power the board by itself over here is taking. I want to know what the board is taking. But I cannot know what the board is taking if the battery is plugged in because the battery is going to take different amounts of power. So what do I mean when I say the battery is going to take different amounts of power? What I mean is that if the battery is almost fully charged, it's probably going to take only 1 or 200 milliamps, whereas if the battery is not charged at all, it may take 3 to 4 amps. So since the, and since the power supply is just telling me how much power is the machine as a whole is drawing, I can't tell how much the board is taking by itself when I have an external variable like the battery there because the battery is taking a different amount of amperage depending on how much is charged. So I unplug the battery, and then I plug the machine in. And the first thing I notice here is that this charge port is wiggling. This wobbles around. So what this tells me is that this has been opened by an idiot because this should not wobble around. So most likely the long screw is put in the short hole. And if the long screw is put in the short hole, the long screw is put in the other holes as well. <laughs> you know, I did not have the cottage to kick your ass directly, but I could, you know? You know I'm involved with black magic? You know you're going to have another accident! So we're looking at this around 1 o'clock tomorrow, by the way. So this one's, I think, $3,000, and the one next to it is $3,500. And they're only a few blocks away, so I'm thinking of renting these as separate spaces. Yeah, so look at this. There's a lot of potential here. Because, again, if they want, want $3,500 a space, I'll jump at that immediately. It's... I'll take two of them. I don't even know what to do with the second store. I'll just, I'll just take it. Even though it's a little bit of a fixer-upper, this is New York. And most like, if, if you go looking for a space like that, you're going to hear sh stuff like from my, uh, the fuckface owners of this building that wanted $27,000 for a space a few blocks down from here that's a tiny bit larger. Oh, what a fuckface thing. I can't. Have I told you how much I don't like the people that own this building? I really don't like the people who own this building. I genuinely despise them. Hey, Lewis. Oh, what's that? You have no heat and it's seven degrees outside? Sure. We'll get back to you. Two weeks later, you bring my heaters that are the equivalent of somebody going in front of a lighter. 
Yeah, I went to the people who, you know, the owners of the building, and I said, I get that most places in New York City, they don't want, when they buy a building, they look to sit on it for 10 years, uh, sell it at, at a markup, and keep it, you know, keep it empty so that they don't have to deal with the higher property taxes or tenants that are going to mess with it. I, I, or they're just going to look for the Chase and Starbucks kind of tenant. I, I totally get that. And if you're looking to do that here, that's fine. Just let me know. But if you're not looking to do that, and you want to rent me the space next door and extend my lease, I will renovate the space to make it look more pristine than an Apple store. Both of these spaces, I will tear them down, I will gut them, I will start from scratch. I'll make sure they look beautiful and that it increases the property value of the building. Just let me know what you'd like to do. And rather than be a man and say, no, we would rather just get rid of you as soon as the lease is up, rather than have any sense of, rather than have any kind of balls to, for genuine human honesty or interaction. They, they, the guy doesn't come reach out to me. He has some low-level staffer reach out to me and say, we would like to offer you the, the courtesy of, you know, let me, I want to read the exact email. I don't know who you spoke to at Hub, but I am talking about a different space across the street at 131 First Avenue. That's what I was talking about. I wanted to give you the courtesy of discussing a possibly completely new lease because of all that happened at 186 First Avenue. I think you may love the space I'm talking about, so I hope we can discuss further. Like, you couldn't tell me yourself that you don't want to give me the space. You, just, you, couldn't, you couldn't tell me yourself that I couldn't take the space next door. You couldn't tell me, hey, we don't, we don't really want people like you here. We don't want people that don't want to pay $30,000 for a box here. Just, just be honest. You couldn't even say that to me face to face. You had to send your fucking barely, you know, newly graduated college assistant to me to say, to ignore my question and then offer me a space that's $27,000. I asked you about the space next door, asshole. I asked you about extending the lease here, asshole. I did not fucking ask you about a hole in the wall for $27,000 fucking dollars. And I, I, this, I, I blew my stack when I read the courtesy part. I absolutely blew my stack at reading the courtesy part. Okay. So the building went on fire, most likely because the sushi place next door had an accident because they had a high rent. At least they were stuck in and no customers. And there was a fire. Fine. And, and then there was no heat for several months. And when we asked, hey, is there anything you can do in terms of electric heat or getting the gas turned on? Anything. Even if you can't get the gas turned back on, can you bring us some heaters or something? You ignore us for two weeks. And then two weeks later, you bring these fucking little, uh, these hair dryers that you probably couldn't even reflow a goddamn GPU with. Because of all that, as a courtesy for your basement being flooded and all this, as a courtesy, we're going to offer you a $27,000 space. That's like teeny tiny bit bigger than the one you have now. Fuck you, building owners. Fucking fuck you in the ass. I was very nice when I went to their office. Very nice. But that genuinely got me nowhere. Now, if you take a look at where the long screws were, you see how it kind of scrapes the board down there? So do you see how there's a, there's a screw hole indentation on the board itself? This is what long screw does. And that's why you should never put the long screw in the short hole. Make one store Apple certified. That's actually a cool idea. I could have two stores side by side and one would be Apple certified, one not Apple certified. So we could have like red pill, blue pill. What do you guys think of that actually? No, this, wow. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, let's, let's do this. What, those two stores that I just showed you, we have the blue pill and the red pill. Go left, Apple tell you buy a new one. Go right to get the truth. Okay, now here's where the second question comes in. Is it worth paying $7,000 a month to have a meme store? Because at this point, th those two stores would exist purely as a meme. So we'd have Apple authorized and Apple unauthorized. And they would be right next to each other. One store could be, all, the, the theme, the paint, the sign could all be blue. And the other store, the, scene, the, the theme, the sign would all be red. So this would actually be like red pill, blue pill. Do you want the lies or do you want the truth? Do you want to understand, do you think that the reason that your machine has no graphics is because you were using it wrong or holding it wrong? Or do you think the reason your machine has no graphics is because we didn't, you know, our U8900 uh, is coming desoldered from the board because our board fucking flexes inside the housing of a $3,000 machine. <laughs> Oh, man, oh. this is such a terrible way to spend money as a business owner. But, man, that would be so cool. Meme store. Okay, now the only thing is, here's the thing. I could afford it. I could pay that. I could, you know, again, adding 7000 a month to the company rent is no big deal. Adding 20000 a month to the company rent, that, that, that's not happening. 
But I think that we would make more money if I had those two spaces. We'd be able to take on more items. We'd be able to do things faster. We'd be able to ch see do inventory checks quicker. I could add uh, items to the store faster. I think it would be great. I think I could make up the money for that. The issue that I have with that idea is how am I going to have an Apple authorized repair shop because if I apply to be Apple authorized, even if I take all the certifications and I, and, uh, I take all the license tests or whatever the hell there is and I pass all that, there's no way in hell my name is getting Apple authorized. So I'd need to find somebody who was already Apple authorized who would be willing to loan me that certification or allow me to use that as, as part of my meme store. So if anybody runs an Apple authorized service provider shop, would they be willing to allow me to use their name and have my company deal with everything in that location right next to my unauthorized location? So one location would be, this location would stay, and those two stores that I showed you, you'd have one store, that's where Paul and Camille and Mikey are going to be dealing with shipping, receiving mail-ins and sending out mail-ins, and they would be, they're not exactly customer service people, but they would be dealing with the customer directly. And right next door to it, I would need to have a store where that was under somebody else's company name who's already Apple authorized. So I would need to find somebody who is, Apple, who is an Apple authorized service provider who would be willing to allow me to use their name for my meme store. And then we could do red pill, blue pill. This does not make business sense, but this makes meme sense. And think about it, New York is a tourist location too. So this could be one of the places that you go to if you're going to New York and you're going to, we could make this amazing. What we could do is we could go through the Apple handbook of how to deal with customers. So somebody's told me that there's a handbook out there that says how you're supposed to talk to customers, vocabulary you can use, vocabulary you can't use. And I'm not saying that anybody should ever email me a copy of that because that would be wrong at lewis at rossmangroup.com. That's L-O-U-I-S at R-O-S-S-M-A-N-N-G-R-O-U-P.com. Identity will be protected. Your anonymity will be guaranteed. That being said, you should never email me stuff like that because that'd be totally wrong. But if you were to email me something like that, we could have t-shirts in the Blue Pill store that say the things that Apple says when you go to the store. I'm sorry, we cannot do that, but would you like to buy another one? We could have all the things that they say on t-shirts in the Blue Pill Apple store that would be right next to the Red Pill Apple store. We could have somebody there who's dressed like a genius, and that would be a person that has gone through the Apple authorized service provider certification process, and you could buy merchandise at that store. We could tell kilted Tim t-shirts. <laughs> this is an 820-3787 MacBook. So we're not getting a green light in the charger. The first rail that we need to get a green light in the charger is going to be PP3V42 underscore G3 hot. So I'm going to turn on Paul Daniels' software, get that going on the screen. Now the first rail that we need is PP3V42 underscore G3 hot. Because if we look at the charge port over here, if you look at the charge port over here, you'll notice charge port J7000, Mac safe DC power jack. That has a signal called adapter sense. Adapter sense is going to go to this chip. This chip allows the adapter sense line to speak to the system management controller. This chip over here, the system management controller, is, well, manages the system. Duh, it turns on the charger. And this chip is not going to turn on unless it gets PP3V42 from this chip. So PP3V42 is the first rail that we need for anything in the system to work. Okay, so we're getting 3.4 volts. So we have 3.4 volts at PP3V42. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go down my list of power rails and check if my PP bus is there. So my PP bus is supposed to be G3 hot, right? Let's see if it's G3 hot or G3 not. 12.3. Now, 12.3 volts tells me that my SMC is not running. So the SMC over here is going to be what is going to speak to my charger to tell it to turn on. So here, adapter sense goes into U7000. And then U7000 is going to allow the adapter sense line to speak with the SMC chip. Uh, which is at sys1 wire, on the sys1 wire line, tilted Kim. <laughs> oh, good stuff. And this over here is the SMC. Now, the SMC, this chip, is going to have communication with several different chips. So the SMC is not only going to speak to the charger, it's also going to speak to another chip that makes the primary system voltage from the charger. So let me show you how that works. So over here, you have the SMC, and it has a data line with this chip called a battery charger, U7100, which Apple lists as ISL6258 rather than 6259 because whoever made the schematic is drunk. Now, if we take a look at that chip that makes PPBus G3 hot, which is the rail that we were just looking at, not only does it have a data line with the SMC, yeah, this has a data line with the SMC, this chip that has a data line with the SMC creates PPBus G3 hot. Now, one thing that we've come to notice over the years is that if the SMC is working and it's on, 
it speaks to U7100 and says, hey, hi, how are you? Can you give us 12.6 volts instead of 12.3? And when it doesn't work, it doesn't say that to the uh, U7100. So when I measure PPYG3 hot, and it says that we're only getting 12.3 volts rather than 12.6 volts, what that does is it tells me the SMC is not on and that it does need to be turned on in order for things to work. So let's take a look over at the SMC area and see what it looks like. Com this is pretty, pretty uh, clean looking. Now, the next thing I'm going to want to do is check in the the uh, reset circuit here to see if it's actually being told to turn on. So let's check the SMC reset circuit. Now what is an SMC reset circuit? The SMC, as I said, is powered by PP3V42. Now PP3V42 is the first rail to turn on in the machine, and it's going to take a little bit of time for that rail to stabilize. If the SMC automatically turns on, as soon as that rail comes on, it's going to crash because, the S because that rail is not going to be 3.4. It's going to be 2 volts when it starts, or 4, or 6, whatever. The quarter of a second it takes for that rail to stabilize, or that microsecond it takes to stabilize, is still enough to set the SMC off and cause it to crash as it tries to turn on. So there's a chip over here, and with the point being of this chip, what this chip is going to do is it's going to make sure that the SMC doesn't turn on until SMC reset L is pulled up. So the underscore L, when you see this next to a signal, underscore L means this signal is only present when the voltage is low. So the SMC will be reset when that voltage is low. If the voltage is 0 or 0 0.5, the SMC will be reset. If that signal is 3.4 volts, the SMC is going to not be reset and it will work. So think of this like you're holding down the power button, not the whole button, you're holding down the reset button on a desktop PC. If you hold down the reset button on a desktop PC, it's not going to post. The same is true here. Now, if you take a look, you'll see that there's a pull-up resistor that is making sure that the 3.4 volts is always present on SMC reset L. However, U7100 is then going to take that and pull it down. It's going to pull that signal down and keep it there for about a quarter of a second. So we're going to see if SMC reset L is present on this board. And we can find SMC reset L in this area around the SMC right over here. So let's see what's present. Digressing is all you do, says Paul Daniels. I don't have a comeback to that. I, really, I genuinely have no comeback to that. I don't know if I should be offended, complimented, really kind of confused. All right, so we have 3.4 volts and SMC reset. So this is where this starts to get tricky. So the SMC is being told to turn on. The SMC itself is not at all corroded. And in spite of the SMC not being corroded, in spite of the SMC being told to turn on, our PP bus is 12.3 volts. So now I'm going to look over the board for some hints and see if there's anything around here that's going to give me a clue as to why this board is acting this way. So here we have corrosion, and corrosion is definitely something that I take interest in when we have a liquid damage board that's not working properly. But the reason I'm not taking the most interest in this corrosion over here is because this corrosion that you see, ahem, stream deck, really? Four second lag between changing scenes? There we go, stream deck's back. I added some stuff to the stream deck. Uh, check this out. Check this out. Fifth grade. Now get the fuck out of here. Moron. Get the fuck out of my store. Moron. Get the fuck out of my store. Moron. They ran a train on the bit. Moron. They ran a train on the bit. Yes, dear. Fifth grade. Now get the fuck out of here. Get the fuck out of my store. Moron. 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 That being said, let's take a look in the microscope and see what everything looks like on this board. So this is a this is not a circuit that's really important to me. Actually, no, this is important to me. What am I talking about? Hmm. Are 
Okay, this is backlight. That's really not important. But what's this? This 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 strikes me as something familiar. What are you? U seventy one ninety. Oh, you create the power for uh, our U seventy one hundred chip. Yeah. So this thing creates the voltage for use for our ISL six two five nine to work. And ISL six two five nine is the thing that makes PP bus G three hot, which is currently low. So let's just take a look and see if what's supposed to be coming out of this is actually coming out of it. So nice to have the stream deck back. Okay, we got five volts there. 5 volts there, so even though that circuit is corroding, it's actually doing its job. So let's continue around here. Okay, now what do you guys see over here on the keyboard connector? So what's going on here is that typically when you hold the power button down, it's going to reset the SMC. Now, in our situation, I didn't, don't think that that's the problem because the SMC reset signal was held high. However, the pins that are shorted over here on this connector are pins that seem to be imperative. So the pins that look shorted to me are, find my tweezer, pins that seem shorted are pins 4 and 5. 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 appear to have some goop in them. So let's take a look at what those pins are for on the schematic in the board view. So four, that's keyboard on off L and 3.42 volts. So it's that, that's strange, that the on off L, and then the keyboard keys, which is not a big deal. But keyboard on off L, if, that, if there's anything going on there, it's going to think the power button is held down. And when you hold down the power button, that resets the SMC. So let's take a look at what happens when we clean up that connector and see if that makes our board work again. Let's turn on the fume extractor. Hmm. So I'm going to clean up this board a little bit. Love the Ransom videos. Keep it up. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. World's worst soldering coming up right here. Courtesy of only using a pall of flux. Because all the solder on this connector is kind of mixed in with corrosion and other junk. I'm going to redo each pin. Jeopardy music would be nice during quiz times. You know what? I'm th I could actually get Jeopardy music on the stream deck. Okay, so here's a question for all of you. What is... Huh, what is the right amount of flux to use when reflowing a connector? Hi Hi says check your Discord DMs. I never check my Discord DMs. My Discord DMs are so full of crap if I st If I started reading now and didn't accept new ones, I would be reading until the end of the year. Hi, hi, you know damn well I don't read my Discord DMs. And you know why I don't read those DMs, hi, hi. Contact me here. Ah, oh, fine, I'll read my Discord DMs since hi, hi said to. Add this to the stream deck. Disgusting. Hmm. Disgusting practice. Oh, here we go. Play audio. Disgusting practice. 
This is getting kind of fun. Downloads. Disgusting practice. That's a disgusting Yep, I'm never going to get any work done again. What is customer service for So we've made our keyboard connector here look very nice, as you can see. I have high hopes for this keyboard connector. So what I'd like to do is plug this in and see if we have any difference in our results now. Let's plug this in and see what the results are. OK, as you can see, re redoing the keyboard connector got us a light. And we're also going to see if that light has translated into being a fan spin. Get the fuck out of my store. I have a set of Axiom M60 speakers in the front now. So I can actually play this fairly nice volume and let people really know that they need to get the fuck out of my store. Okay, so we have a light in the charger and the fan is spinning. So let's take a look at what goes on when the, when the power button thinks it's turned down. I'm going to go over what I think was going on with this machine uh, from beginning to end. And let's, so the first thing that I noticed was that we were not getting a green light on the charger. And the circuitry that's going to allow us to get a green light in the charger can be seen if we follow along over to the section of the machine where the, the charger comes in. So this is where the charge port plugs into the computer over here. And we see we have 20 volts, we have ground, and we have adapter sense. Adapter sense is a line that's going to be able to speak to the system management controller. The system management controller needs to speak with the charger and hear, hi, I'm a Snowflake Apple charger. Hi, Snowflake Apple charger. Hi, I'm ready to be turned on. I will send you 18 volts, and so on and so forth. So they have that, and I will let you turn on the machine with the, the power of my snowflakey Apple overpriced goodness. Now, this over here is not going to speak directly to the SMC on that Sys1 wire line, because if it does, that's potential to kill the SMC. This is a 20-volt power line, and this is a 3-volt data line. If somebody is drunk and wasted and trying to plug their connector in all like, like, blah, 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 like you know, they're, they're wasted, they're high, they're drunk, and they're trying to do some shit like that, what's going to happen is that the 20-volt line from the charger is going to go to the 3-volt line for the SMC, and the SMC is going to go, Pshh! and that is, that, that's going to be bad. Same way, same thing will happen Apple stock price when my channel hits a million subscribers someday. One can only dream. So that is something that we are looking to avoid. So to avoid that, we put U7000 in as a buffer. This says, oh, are you a 3.3 volt adapter sense line? Go right ahead. Speak to my SMC. Oh, are you a 20 volt uh, power line? F you. You're blocked. You're not going to my SMC. Screw that. Now, this circuit was, is what speaks to the SMC. Now, we made sure that we had PP3V4 too, the power rail that's going to allow this, this chip to turn on and send power to this one. That was all working as we expected. Our adapter send signal was 3 volts as expected, and we went over to our SMC area, and the SMC was not corroded. The SMC area over here had zero corrosion. This is what's going to speak to the charger. Now, we also, interestingly enough, 
we checked our SMC reset signal, and SMC reset L was actually present, I, which is strange because the issue that we were getting is that we weren't getting a green light because the SMC wasn't turning on. We confirmed the fact that the SMC wasn't turning on by checking the voltage on another chip that is controlled by the SMC. So over here, you can see this. This is a totally separate chip on the board, but this chip, the U7100, it creates a signal, uh, voltage called PP bus G3 hot. It speaks to the SMC. The SMC talks to it, and it tells it, make me 12.56 volts. But if the SMC is unable to talk to it, it's not going to make it 12.56 volts. This chip will only make 12.3. It needs the SMC to say, hey, bro, I need more voltage than that. And if the SMC is not turning on, this is not going to happen. So the lack of green light combined with the lack of 12.6 volts being made by this chip, which it usually is making if the SMC is talking to it, led us to believe that the SMC was not turning on. The lack of corrosion by the SMC led me to believe that the SMC was not turning on, not because it was broken, but rather there was another external factor. So what are those other external factors? Over here, you can see SMC on off L is a signal that goes to our SMC reset chip. So this SMC reset chip is going to make sure that SMC reset L is held low, as in SMC will be reset when the signal is low, like zero volts, for about a quarter of a second when the machine first gets plugged in, so that the, well, the SMC doesn't crash. Because the, we're going to keep the SMC from crashing when PP3V42 power rail turns on with the machine. We're going to give it a little second to stabilize. That SMC reset signal was there. SMC on off L can control that signal. It's one of the, one of the many ways of controlling that signal or putting it into a reset mode again. Now, SMC on off L, it means, hey, I'm hitting the power button, turn the machine on or off when I'm low, and that is controlled by something near the keyboard. So we have R, we have R4810, and that's going to be a resistor between the keyboard and SMC on off L, which means that our keyboard, it, which is where the power button is attached to, has the ability to control SMC reset. So not only does SMC on off L, not only does this power button on the computer show you the power button. Not only does my power button turn the, just turn the computer on, the power button also has the capability to reset my SMC. And the SMC on off L signal is going to be present on pin 5. And if we take a look at pin 5, that was the pin that was corroded. So we went over the board with the proper amount of flux, none of that Paul shit, we, we made sure we use the proper amount of flux because we're, we're not going to give people on this channel the idea that they got to buy less flux because, you know, that, that, that's, what, that's one of our main revenue streams, Paul. You got to stop that shit. Anyway, we used a proper amount of flux to redo this connector. So I, I added solder to a bunch of the pins. I then wicked that solder away, and then I added solder again, and then I kind of cleaned it a little with the hot air. I'm going to give it one more cleaning with the hot air later. And then this is going to go through the ultrasonic cleaning. We are going to touch up any of these areas, even though this section of the board is working, and that's working. We're going to touch that stuff up later to make sure that it looks better, because I could leave the board like that, but that's kind of... That's kind of mean and messed up. Uh, we want to make sure that this board goes back to the customer in a condition where it is actually going to last for a long time. I want all of my customers to be happy. I don't want there to just be a, a large percentage of users. I don't want a small percentage of people to have problems. I don't want a small percentage to have problems. I want to be happy people. And if you want to watch any of this stuff in an environment where there are less advertisements or higher quality, then but please, I urge you to check out boards.rossmangroup.com. On boards.rossmangroup.com, the videos are sorted by the model of the board. So you can go through every single model board, or you can check by the problem that you have with your board. So you can scroll here and you can see X on battery, this rail missing, that rail missing, no keyboard, no trackpad, green light missing, uh, battery not charging, random kernel panics. And when you click on any one of these issues, it'll present you with a playlist that shows you all of the videos that I've made related to that issue. And this is in a YouTube-free environment. So not only do you not have to deal with pre-roll or post-roll ads, but you also get to deal with a higher quality of video since these videos are compressed by Vimeo, not by YouTube, where it gives you just a little bit of better power. I mean, better quality. And above all, again, I... I pay $979 a year for my videos to be hosted on Vimeo, and there's no monetization. I get paid by YouTube for my videos to be on YouTube with monetization. So I lose money when people decide to view on Vimeo, but I make money when people decide to view on YouTube. And I am still suggesting that you stop watching my videos on YouTube and start watching them on Vimeo.
should tell you something about the amount of respect I have for Google. So that's, uh, that's uh, one board out of the queue. And as always, I hope you learned something. Thank you very much for watching. And if you like, before it goes out of stock, don't delay. Get your ultrasonic cleaners that are open box or your 64 gigabytes of fuck Apple RAM today on store.rossmangroup.com. Not only do we have ultrasonic cleaners that are available at very low prices, these ultrasonics are 50% off. Somebody actually just bought the P1200 a few minutes ago, so the only thing we have left is the P, I believe the P500, H45, and this P230. Not only can you get an open box ultrasonic cleaner for 50% off as long as you're willing to do a local pickup. These are local pickup only. There is no box. You must pick up the cleaner. But we are also selling 64 gigabytes of fuck Apple RAM. This is not Apple RAM. We do not want you to be confused and believe that this is Apple RAM. This RAM will not work in a MacBook. This is not Apple RAM. This is fuck Apple RAM. Hundreds of millions of people around the globe have computers with Apple RAM in them. But today is your limited time opportunity to put genuine OEM Rossman Group fuck Apple RAM inside your machine. Don't delay. Buy today. All right. With that, we move on to the next MacBook. Do you have a MacBook that needs to be fixed? Come by our store, which is open to the public at 186 First Avenue in Manhattan. Are you located outside of New York? No problem. We have a live chat where you can speak with us about the repair that you need, a phone number where a representative will pick up during our open hours where you can contact us about repairs. Send us a machine from anywhere in the world by going to our website and clicking on the mailbox or simply heading over to sendyourmacbook.com. That's sendyourmacbook.com where you'll be redirected to our mail-in instructions page that includes the form and the directions on how to send us a MacBook for repair. Don't delay. Click our affiliate link down below.